OK, so I think that we can start um, in case if anyone have any problems with joining us. Uh, all presentation is recorded, so we will just send you the record of this of this lecture and you will be able to send it, uh, send it to your students and to anyone who, who is interested but, but couldn't join. So uh, first of all, uh, my name is Natalia. Thank you again for being here. Uh, here uh, is also my friend uh, Piotr, who will be helping me with uh, the live uh, part of our presentation. Uh, so at the end of the lecture, you will be able to see how the scanning process, like briefly see <laughs> what, how the scanning process looks like and, uh, and the software as well, and uh, what possibilities you have uh, with it. Uh, so, um, the title of this lecture uh, is um, 3D Scanners, New Device in the Archaeological Work. Um, nowadays, a lot of new possibilities and new devices are available um, also uh, in, in many industries, also in archaeology. Um, many of you probably worked already with uh, Total Station is uh, not the newest technology, but advanced technology at least. Uh, and I hope that 3D scanners will be something like Total Station in a few years in the field of archaeology, because it gives a lot, a lot of possibilities uh, in our work. It can make it a lot, a lot easier. Um, me, I am an archaeologist with a few years of experience already. Uh, I worked on the field, I work at the university. Uh, now I work as a, a specialist, like 3D technology, uh, in archaeology specialist in the company, Polish company, Smart Tech 3D. It's a company uh, with over 20 years of experience, uh, is a producer and inventor of a technology, of a devices, uh, and we work not only in Poland, um, but also abroad. Um, in a few minutes, I will show you uh, just a few examples to know that um, the, the knowledge that this company gave me in case of using 3D technology and 3D scanning uh, is, is really big. Uh, and I had a possibility to compare uh, a lot of uh, ways to use it and I think it can be really, really useful. It has huge potential for us. Uh, today we will be talking uh, about what actually digitalization, visualization and archiving is. Uh, those are terms that we can we can meet in our work, especially nowadays when a lot a lot of things is is digital uh, and they are, they have different meanings. So it's important to know the differences. Uh, we will also uh, say what 3D digitalization is. Uh, then I will use some examples from uh, from work from my work from the work uh, of uh, of this company because I think that it's the easiest way to understand uh, the, the possibilities that 3D scanning can give uh, to, to archaeologists, to mm, in museology conservation as well, uh, by just showing the examples. Uh, on at the end of the examples, we will have the part of a live show. So, uh, so Peter, we will, uh, he will help me in here. Uh, and at the end, summary and um, time for any questions, if you will have one. As I said, uh, the company I uh, get my knowledge from uh, is already on the market uh, over 20 years. Uh, it's not like uh, copying the, the technology that was already here. Um, the company uses the technology invented uh, in the Institute of Technology in Warsaw. Uh, now we work in Poland and abroad. Uh, we have uh, scanners all over the world, actually. I choose just a few examples to show you. Uh, I, I focus mainly on those uh, connected with archaeology or museology. So you can see many museums, international, like National Museum in Taiwan, uh, 
uh, but also in Poland, in Warsaw, a few universities, uh, university in Ghent, uh, and uh, such a big names everyone knows, like uh, like NASA or US Army on city or city projects, uh, worked with us as well. Um, but going to the main topic, uh, the differences between those three terms. Digitalization is transforming a real object into its digital image uh, and with using dedicated software we can we can take this image and uh, change it uh, to um, any purposes we need. Uh, we can make uh, comprehensive measurements with the data uh, we we can uh, collect that way. We can make virtual reconstruction on research. Uh, it will be clearly visible on the examples I will show later. Uh, and of course, digitalization nowadays is often used in archaeology as an element mainly for now as a conservation process uh, because it's just a great way uh, to document uh, document the collection. Uh, archiving is a digital record uh, with an accuracy that allows creating model identical with the one, the original one. Uh, so it's um, more accurate digitalization, I would say, like a very, very simple way. Uh, it's an important element of museum's work. Uh, because, for example, in case of um, damage or destruction or even conservation process, sometimes it can be really invasive. Uh, museum have to have uh, basic documentation, uh, not basic, the documentation of a collection or on its original stage. Uh, as, as we know, we are mainly archaeologists in here. Uh, the main focus of our work is not only to discover, but also to protect what we already have and what we found, to protect it uh, for, for other scientists or for next generation, because the materials we work with can be really fragile and without our help sometimes uh, it can be gone uh, soon. And visualization, uh, is achieving an image of a real object that includes only its main features. Uh, that means you are not able to make any research on the data that are um, dedicated for visualization because the accuracy is not good enough. Uh, you, with this image, you have main features, you have the shape, you can show how uh, how something looks like, but the accuracy is not detailed enough to make any measurements on it. But the data file is smaller, so sometimes when we don't need to make any measurements or any research we just want to show, uh, it, it can be useful as well. 3D digitalization is a uh, transforming the real object into its digital image, uh, but saved in three-dimensional form. Uh, now we have few different 3D digitalization methods. I will tell shortly about them um, soon. Uh, we don't have any uh, official guidelines of which uh, methods should be used uh, in a spe for specific tasks. There are also not, there is also not one method that is uh, that can be used in for everything we want to do in archaeological field. So every time we have to choose the method based on the specification of the artifact, so uh, the size, uh, shape and material of the object and the technical parameters uh, of an expected results. Um, basic technical parameters uh, in the scanning process are resolution. So uh, the number of points uh, that are in one millimeter square, or in other words, the minimal distance between the measured points. Accuracy, that is a maximal mistake of a placement of registered measured points. So uh, accuracy, non-accuracy tells us 
what is possible mistake of every point that is measured. Color mapping and format of the final data. Here we don't have to explain more. 3D digitalization methods we can divide into passive and active methods. Passive methods are those uh, which don't project any kind of light on the artifact. Here we can uh, tell about photogrammetry. It's the, the best known in archaeology. Uh, me, me by myself, I was working with photogrammetry even before. I was, I was still a student when I first met my photogrammetry at my work, so probably some of you also know about it. Um, and structure from motion. I will describe it um, in a few minutes. Uh, to tell more about photogrammetry, photogrammetry enables to achieve a 3D models based at on at least two photos. But of course, if you want to have a better uh, or usable um, model, you need more than two photos. Uh, it is recommended sometimes to use at least 80 photos, depends on, on what paper you read. Um, and um, possible resolution uh, in photogrammetry can be 0 0.1 millimeters, accuracy up to 0 0.5. Um, here, um, advantages of a photogrammetry is you you don't have any restrictions connected with the size of an object you want to document and you want to have a model of. Uh, and what you achieve uh, is realistic. You have uh, you are able to create a triangle mesh, uh, a simple triangle mesh with texture, uh, so you can see how actually more or less uh, this object looked like. Um, and of course, it's relatively small cost of the devices you need to to uh, to do the model with photogrammetry. Actually, there are even uh, apps on your phone. You can make some basic models with with just your your smartphone. Uh, but the coordinates of this model are um, determined only in the chosen characteristic points. So the rest of the points uh, in this in this model are only estimated. Uh, we know exactly uh, the measurements of uh, the or the placement only on the for the chosen chosen points characteristic points uh, from the photos uh, and the software that is needed for making a model in photogrammetry uh, is relatively more complicated than in the other um, methods I will uh, describe. So you need some professional training to use it properly. The second method, structure from motion, is the second passive method. Here you can also achieve a 3D model with use of a photos, but here you don't have any reference to the measuring scale. So this method can be used only to for the visualization. As I said, you can make a realistic 3D model. Uh, you also have some information about the, about the texture. You don't have any restriction connected with size. And uh, as in uh, another passive methods, the cost of the devices are relatively small. Uh, but uh, data you can register with these methods. As I said, they are not placed in the um, um, in any relation to the measuring scale. So you have correct angles. That means you see the shape of an object, but you don't you're you cannot be really sure based on only the model. What are uh, what is the size of this object, for example? And the final results of uh, of this uh, scanning methods is not verified by the software, so you as a scientist have to look at the model and um, determine if you want to use it or not because uh, it can be that the model has some inconsistencies in geometry. Uh, 
Uh, another um, method of 3D digitalization is active. Here, co data collecting is based on the registration of the projected beam. Uh, we can, uh, as active method, we can classify laser triangulation, time of flight, and structural light technology. Those will be the three I will describe briefly. Laser triangulation is a method of making a, um, or creating a 3D model uh, based on the registration of the projected laser beam, uh, laser on the object. Uh, so sometimes uh, we cannot use it uh, or it's not recommended to use it on some kind of artifacts. Uh, always with a um, conservator, you have to consult if you can use a uh, laser on some types, of, some types of artifacts. Possible resolution 0 0.1 millimeters, accuracy 0 0.05. So as you can see, accuracy with the active methods, it's, it's much, much better already. Uh, you have, uh, you can achieve 3D geometry, uh, you, your model, uh, the geometry of your 3D model um, is sample even on the whole surface. That means um, the shape of, of the, an actual model uh, is registered every point on the, sh on the uh, shape of a uh, actual object is measured um, like regularly on the whole surface. Uh, measuring is possible in the sun sunlight with laser triangulation and every measured point has determined measurement uncertainty. That means uh, you, you know every point you measured, you know uh, what is possible mistake of the placement of this uh, measured point. But with laser triangulation, the uh, registration time is long and the device can be uh, or is very complicated so um, the device is sensitive to the calibration or damage. Uh, here with laser triangulation the registration of color is worse than in the two other active methods I will tell, uh, I will tell you about uh, and for us, for archaeologists, uh, the color can tell a lot as well. So um, this, this um, ability to register color correctly or perfectly uh, is, is important. The second method, the time of flight method. Uh, here you, you, um, you achieve a 3D model based on the uh, registered time of flight of the projected laser beam, so it's laser based as well. Uh, and also 3D geometry sampling is even on the whole surface and every measured point has determined measurement uncertainty like before. And measuring, measuring is possible in the sunlight, but um, the, uh, this method is recommended because of like the basics, the basis of this method. So the registration of the flight of the laser beam uh, is recommended for the bigger surfaces. Measuring device also can be sensitive to the calibration. And as I said, not, should not be used for a smaller object. The last method, uh, Mm, structural light uh, using scanning with structural light technology. Uh, here uh, you achieved um, the, the cloud of point with the registration of color and texture. Uh, here in, in Smart Tech there is a special dedicated light uh, line of, of scanners uh, with this technology that is safe for, uh, for artifacts uh, and is focused on registration, the color and the texture of a model, and you can use it on smaller object. Actually, it's recommended to use it for a smaller object. Uh, the biggest resolution uh, of all methods that I described and accuracy is 0 0.005, so it's it's bigger uh, than the, the uh, one described before as well. 
Here also 3D geometry sampling is even on the whole surface. Uh, and every measured point has uh, is placed uh, in the coordinate system. So it's not like in photogrammetry, only characteristic points, uh, you know exactly when they are, where they are in the coordinate system. Here, every single point uh, is, uh, is placed in the coordinate system and you have points like every 0 0.1 millimeters. Every measured point has determined measurement and certainty. As I said, you know exactly what is the possible mistake of the measuring of every point. Here it can be 0 0.005 millimeters, so it's it's really small as well. Um, with the uh, scanners that I was working with, uh, so this line I talked about, the measuring device is resistant to the calibration and damage, and they have also uh, like special housing and the filters that allows to use it even on the field. So it's it's great. Mm, but here you it's not recommended to use this method on the sunlight. It is possible to use it but uh, the results will be worse than without, than without uh, measuring in the sunlight, measuring inside somewhere or in the shade, even a tent. Um, and as I said, it's recommended for smaller objects, bigger objects you can measure as well, uh, but it's more time consuming. So to sum up, we have in 3D digitalization methods, passive and active methods. Passive methods don't project any kind of light on the artifact. We have photogrammetry that uh, creates 3D model based on the photos uh, and every measured point has, uh, is placed in the coordinate system, uh, not every, uh, sorry, uh, chosen points, characteristic points are placed in the a coordinate system and structure from motion that creates a 3D model based on photos but without a relation to the scale. Active methods uh, here uh, data collecting is based on the registration of projected beam. It can be light, it can be laser. Uh, laser triangulation uh, creates a model based on the registration of the laser beam. Time of flight creates a model based on the registration of the time of flight of the projected beam and the structural light technology that creates a cloud of points based on the uh, light uh, projected uh, light beam. 3D scanning process, how it looks like, actually you will see it on the live show as well. First we select an artifact, then it is the time for measurements. Uh, the measurements create a cloud of points which we can transfer into a triangle mesh. Uh, then we can add a texture and a color on this triangle mesh and we will achieve a model that we can use in many purposes. And now uh, for some examples. First of all, when we think about uh, about 3D digitalization, what we can use it for, uh, it's digitalization of the collection. Here you can see the video from the uh, National Museum of Prehistory in Taiwan. They are using uh, scanners with uh, structural light technology from SmartTech. Uh, they are uh, um, digitalizing every like whole collection they have. Uh, you can watch it up close uh, online. Uh, they are creating many exhibitions that are available um, for for people through the internet. Also, they are uh, making some um, some courses and some lessons for people who are interested in to uh, to show how this technology looks like and of course they have uh, archive of archival data of whole collection from the museum it's a huge museum here you will be able to see those are models from this museum and you can watch it really close you can just turn it around uh, and I'm waiting uh, on the right corner. You will see I haven't seen it like on the live artifact actually like from the photos, but 
there is there is something in here like some sign and it's perfectly visible as well in here. The other example from uh, from my country will be the museum. Uh, actually, no, uh, we have a project uh, of few museums in Poland. Uh, a lot uh, is doing it, but there is a one particular and this photo is from this one. It's museum in Lublin. Uh, actually, uh, they have also, you will be seeing it uh, in the video, one very special artifact uh, from uh, from the Neolithic period. Uh, oh yeah, it's this one. Um, if you will be interested in some more about the history of all of those artifacts, I can of course tell you later. Uh, but a similar project like this one from the National Museum in Taiwan, uh, digitalization of the collection and then it's it's available online now when we uh, we were stuck in a place because of coronavirus it we know how it, important it is it gets to us to to be able to see some things uh, through the internet also when we are working and making some papers uh, archaeologists just know we have to travel around or our paper is not completed because sometimes some types of artifacts are far away in the museums all over the world. Uh, so if museums like that, like online museums would be more popular and everyone would do that, it will be that much easier to make uh, to make good papers. Another purpose of 3D scanning process can be uh, creating an online uh, databases, scientific databases. Uh, here we have an example of using uh, this this line of scanners I told you about from Smart Tech uh, in the University in Łódź in Poland. Uh, they have huge collection of human skulls, so it's not only artifacts; it's uh, for anthropologists as well. Uh, it's it's really special because this group of, of um, remains, of human remains, are from one place, it calls Brzezd Kujawski, uh, and there, there is a continuity, a settlement continuity from 11th to 19th century. And there is a project, uh, anthropological project to, uh, to make a research and check how the appearance of a population changed through through the centuries and they have perfect collection for that and are making uh, scans of whole collection uh, they combine it with the dna tests as well uh, for now i think it's around 200 on online available online uh, so it's much easier for uh, you can see how close you can you can check it uh, even inside every every piece of the skull that is missing is visible. So you can make measurements and check and compare skull to skull actually from your home. You don't have to travel to Poland. Different use here, unfortunately, I don't have a video, uh, but uh, you don't, it's, it's not only like sharing the collection uh, between uh, in the area of, of one country, you can also share collection uh, abroad, inter intercontinental even. Here we have an example uh, from, from Georgia. It's a flint collection uh, found by Polish archaeologist Professor Krukowski. Uh, it's, uh, those are residues from a Paleolithic industry and um, in the 100th, center, uh, 100th anniversary, uh, the university in Warsaw contacted uh, the museum in Georgia uh, to, to make an uh, exhibition about this, uh, about this collection, and it was possible to just send 3D scans and 3D models to Poland. So without actually shipping the artifacts, uh, students and everyone who's interested from Poland could uh, could see this this huge collection. Um, on the left picture, you can see uh, on the model that um, 
every single line is visible. You were also available to see it up close. This is actually this can be advantage also, but because when you're just a visitor in the museum, it's really rare that you can just watch up close something. And here when you have a uh, not only possibility to to go somewhere and physically watch it, but you have a um, model available online and you can see it really closely. You can you can notice much, much more details. Another use of 3D scanning. Can be uh, creating and editing the artifact copy. Uh, first, on the first video, you will have uh, the example of scanning the coin. It's uh, from Museum in Kalish. It's a denarii from the Boleslav the the brave um, denarii. Uh, yeah, from the from this period, uh, we have only we found only three of those. Uh, it is uh, it is uh, discovered that. It is probably the first or one of the first coins uh, from from this king. Um, so it's really special. A lot of people, a lot of museums want to check it here on the video. You see that uh, also you can check it up close. And uh, what we did, we made a scan of this of this uh, coin and then we edited what we achieved. Uh, to create a sample and we were able to uh, to make a model to actually make copies of this of this of this coin of this denarii. So uh, here you you can see the uh, how it looked like. Uh, so if any museum is interested in and want to show it on the exhibition or you want to show it uh, during the uh, presentation on the or the lecture at university, uh, you can actually have physical uh, denarii with you. You can just make a copy with it or print it out and you just have it. And of course, uh, as a souvenirs, you can use this temple as well. The other example. Is it going on? Uh, of uh, creating and editing the artifact copy is the example from uh, from Mar Malborg Castle Museum in Poland. Also, here you can see the canon. Actually, the the history of this one is quite interesting. During the visit of the Malborg Castle, Castle, one of the uh, history enthusiasts uh, found this one on the exhibition, and he knew that this particular one. Uh, it's uh, it's a special one that first uh, people who are interested in militaries are uh, probably uh, noticed already, but it was found not in this castle, uh, but in the uh, castle nearby. So he contacted the uh, people from from the Malborg castle and they started to think what to do with it. And it was decided to make a copy, the scan, uh, the scan, 3D scan of this of the scanon, uh, make a copy and print it out and send it to the original castle as well uh, because of the um, this project also wanted to change the scanned model to make an alteration to make it actually make it work to be able to uh, to shoot again. Uh, so it was uh, quite the news for some time. It actually also helped to um, to live this part of history again. People were interested about the history and the canon. Another example uh, we can, as I mentioned with this Canon, we can make a 3D printing of an artifact copy. So not only to creating a model and show the model or make an alteration to the model to, to print something else, but you can also just scan it to make a copy. This example you can see on the screen uh, is a very interesting one. Uh, it calls the skull, calls the skull of the vampire from 
uh, from Piotrków. Uh, it's from Cardinal Wyszyński University in Warsaw. Uh, and well, the name is because as you can see through the skull, uh, you have pierced through a metal nail, really long one. And actually the skull was found separate uh, from the body and they were buried together, but uh, head was separated and put a little bit farther from, from the rest of the body. Uh, so it uh, came to mind to uh, scientists, it can be uh, some burial connected with vampirism. Uh, actually, uh, it is suggested it was not uh, right now, but the story by itself and the skull uh, looked really interesting. And during a lot of presentation uh, and conferences, um, scientists wanted to show this this particular one. Um, well, of course, you cannot drive around with the skulls pierced through uh, with the nails because uh, main reason is they are fragile. You can just um, destroy it or damage it. So they make us made a scan, a 3D scan, and print it out. As you can see, it's it looks pretty exact. At the end of the video, you will see uh, after. Um, uh, here, there is a layer of like a protection, uh, protect, prote the protection layer and the skull actually looks identical. The color is there, the shape, the size. So scientists could drive around and just uh, show uh, the skull. Uh, what's more, uh, this university also have like a mobile station. It is a car uh, with the devices from, from Smartech 3D company and they can uh, take and drive wherever it's needed and, and made a scan. What you can also do, not only to scan and use the um, the model of a real object, you can also make a reconstruction. It's uh, more uh, at home with our everyday work. Uh, probably every one of us uh, sometime had to draw a plate or a pottery like this in this stage. Uh, so it's few pieces glued together. It's not, not in touch with each other. Uh, and you have to take it and turn it around to, to draw. And in our work, uh, the shape of an object, the shape of a lip, the shape of a neck, uh, they can be really important. Uh, then can, they can determine the, um, the results of a research. So here we made a scan of, of an object. It's a plate. Uh, it's really highly decorated. These decorations are also really easily visible on the scan, but with the use of the program, uh, dedicated dedicated software, uh, with the model we achieved, we were able to um, make a reconstruction to see how the whole plate probably looked like, what was the shape of it, and then we can create a uh, cross section so we have a perfect measurement of everything the perfect shape of uh, of this plate uh, without actually having to to endlessly touch this this fragile plate And of course, not only reconstruction, but conservation process as well. It's connected with, uh, with reconstruction. Uh, here you can see reconstructed nose of this lion. It's from Warsaw as well. Uh, what what we did was to was we we scanned the the lion the lion's head. Uh, it was quite damaged, uh, but it was uh, it was signed to be uh, conservated. So we had, we scanned it before the conservation, we have it mapped. Then we were able to uh, make a prediction of what, how the conservation process will look like, uh, what, how the head will look like after the conservation process. Uh, based on this model, uh, we were also able to calculate uh, exactly how much of a product will be needed to make this reconstruction. So costs, of course, you will buy only this much 
stuff that you need to to make this reconstruction. And after the reconstruction, we made a scan again and compare both of them. And we we could map uh, how this this uh, artifact changed. So we see exactly uh, or oh, here you can see it more or less and Peter will tell about it also uh, what is the same and what is changed. And of course cross sections. And as I said, basic stuff, uh, measuring uh, the, the the artifact, uh, watching it up close. But I think with this better than the video will be uh, will be the presentation from my colleague. So uh, I will give the stage. OK, so hello everyone one more time. Uh, let me just uh, show you the, the software. Mm. I will just need to stop sharing the screen and do it one more time. OK, uh, so we have our software. Uh, at, at the beginning, I will show you the single scan. Uh, so uh, we project the fringes on the object and the detector is capturing each of the frame. And according to this frame, we get the really high density point cloud and uh, with the really high accuracy. So right now we are using uh, Micron 18 megapixel uh, with the field of view 300 by uh, 200. So the resolution, as you see on the small vase, is uh, pretty high. So between the points, uh, we can have uh, even even 65 microns. Uh, so for a, such a small, uh, such a small details could be visible, like like broken uh, parts or something like that. And to not have the object from the one direction, we can use the turntable. Uh, to not waste the time, uh, I prepare the data earlier uh, using also the shadeless system. Uh, which gives you opportunity to uh, to have really good colors without the shades of the edges on the edges. And here we have uh, done two rotate measurements, which are done automatically. Uh, so it's uh, just a matter of uh, two clicks to get the, such a data. And this data could be transformed for the uh, triangle mesh. Uh, so here we have also the, the mesh and as you can see all of the colors uh, are visible. Uh, we can uh, use this mesh for example for the 3D printing. We can make an measurements on it so we can check uh, the area of a full mesh. Uh, so we will wait a little bit for it. So here we have the, the area of the full mesh but also uh, we can uh, for example select only some part uh, of uh, of our mesh and so we can for example check this uh, and only the part of the selection uh, you can check the area of only the part of uh, of the selection uh, so it's also sometimes very useful uh, to check uh, uh, this parameter and here we have the vase so and next what we can check is the volume of this uh, actual mesh. Uh, so it will be approximately the same as the volume of this, uh, this vase. So here by one click we can uh, also check it without touching, without uh, anything. Uh, you are able to get the really precise uh, uh, parameter. What we can do next with uh, with this? Uh, so as Natalia told you, uh, we can make uh, some cross sections. Uh, so I will make few of them. Okay. And as you can see, we have them. Also, you are able to export these cross sections, but at first we can check the the parameter from point to point going on the mesh. So here you have the green light, a uh, green uh, line, uh, which gives you 
uh, this parameter also have the parameter of the uh, whole cross section and you have the external parameter so the white part of uh, of our cross section also not only checking the total parameter or Paltier parameter are available you can check also the for example the height of the object by clicking two points which are uh, pretty simple here you have uh, the height of uh, our object it's uh, 135 uh, millimeter um, it's also only the matter of uh, of a few clicks also if it's uh, important for you you are able to check the flatness of the object uh, or the sphere deviation um, but what uh, is uh, the really nice feature in our software uh, that you can create the color map uh, of the deviation so i have uh, the same uh, mesh but uh, it is uh, deformed uh, in other program to to show you the difference uh, between our uh, mesh and the point cloud so you can use it for example before the conservation or before uh, giving the uh, artifact uh, for the uh, for some uh, museum and then if it will be back you can just compare it and after computing uh, and after it will be back you scan it again uh, you have the point cloud and you can compare this two object if something is uh, changed or not also you, <clears throat> also you can uh, prepare the report from it uh, so as you can see every defect uh, which uh, which is more than 100 microns so 0 0.1 millimeter uh, will be selected all on the red or on the blue color it depends if there is too much material or too less material and if you want to check the um, the exact dimensions the exact error so we can create some annotation uh, so it gives you the the error uh, in exact points which you can uh, easily uh, easily check also if you will click on the on the green one you will see that uh, it's uh, it's okay also you can uh, prepare this uh, earlier so you can create this annotation um, when you have the first scan just to scan when it will be back for the faster faster work and just to share these results uh, you can uh, for example create the report so we can make annotation view you can make also the error view and uh, the main view so i will turn on uh, our point cloud uh, also you can configure it so put the author name you can uh, add the customer name if you want and after saving it um, let's save it uh, here uh, test base and easily you can uh, find it also um, to show you that the report Here we have it. So we have uh, our date uh, of the order, the date of uh, today. So uh, when we are inspecting, then you have the main view and some deviation view with the, the values like uh, the maximal error on plus and minus. Uh, and also you have your annotation view. Uh, so this is what, uh, what uh, how you can uh, show uh, the exact errors uh, on the on the objects. Of course, you can also export uh, this uh, this triangle mesh uh, for the for the three D printing, even in color. Uh, nowadays, more and more three uh, D printing companies have the the really nice technology to to print with color. So it's uh, also worth to think. And uh, the last but not least, uh, you can put it on the website and create the virtual museums, 
uh, and uh, so on. Um, um, okay, so uh, this was really, really, really quick. Uh, so how you can use the uh, the scanner? Uh, and uh, I think if you have uh, the, the questions, so uh, it's time. Yeah, let's go back to presentation. Yeah. We have like a short summary in there. Oh. So as I told, the 3D scanners have a huge potential for use in archaeology. As you saw, if you will have any ideas or any questions, just feel free to ask or write me later. Uh, I will try to explain everything uh, best I can. Uh, the use of 3D scanners can significantly, uh, significantly speed up and simplify the documentation process. Sometimes to draw uh, and make photos of some complicated, highly decorated uh, item. Uh, of course, first of all, it can be fragile, so it's easy just to break it or damage it while touching uh, endlessly to draw it. Uh, and then to draw, actually, it can take even few days uh, if it's really complicated. Uh, it's also nice when you have some uh, some art talents to to make it really nice. And with 3D scanners, you can just scan it. Uh, you can have uh, in less than an hour uh, the complete uh, complete model. Uh, you can make some uh, some uh, like pictures of this model, for example, if you want something drawn and print it in a, with a scale and just draw it from the printed stuff. So every uh, every um, decoration, everything here you can see. Uh, here you can see even those small, small details on the vase. This is really, really I don't know how high it, it was. It was like, uh, around 40 centimeters. So it's really small one. And here you can on the picture, you will never think this one was actually not not painted. And here you can see it up close and then you can draw it just like that. You don't have to measure it for for some hours. Um, with measuring by hand, it can uh, make a lot of mistakes. You have a lot of possibilities to make some mistakes. With scanning, you you eliminate basically most of the of those mistakes you can make with uh, handwriting or hand um, drawing. Uh, touchless, as I said before, so you just put the uh, artifact on the rotary stage. If you don't have one, then you can just uh, make scan, uh, scans around this object, but you don't need to touch it, uh, especially with a rotary stage. Um, a lot of measurements, what you can make, you can al analyze the shape, you can make a cross section, virtual cross section, detailed one, uh, an exact one, uh, show, watch everything up close. Um, Accuracy of the scan you make uh, allows to create a database for archiving purposes as well. Uh, you can share your research on your or your collection online really easily. Uh, you can perform uh, research for further research uh, on those data. You or your colleagues or someone in the future can also use it as well. You can create a virtual museum on excavate or uh, ex um, show the collection. Um, you can also use this in different purposes than than museology or archaeology. You we have uh, we have uh, um, clients who use the three D scanner for art purposes. So they scan something and they then just uh, modify the model, then have and they they create art this way. And of course, popularization uh, for commercial uh, reasons like making souvenirs uh, and conservation. As I said, and that will be all. Thank you all for for being here. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. 
uh, right now or you have uh, the contact data for me on the screen right now so you can write to me if you have more technical questions i will uh, follow it to to piotr he will answer as well or if you have some now just uh, just let us know and uh, and we will answer also maybe one more uh, thing worth to add the the steps which are uh, didn't show like the measurement and creation of the mesh, it could be done automatically. So that's why I uh, didn't show it uh, to you. It's also the time consuming operation. It take around uh, 10 for uh, 15 minutes. So it's not a very long time uh, for the for the scanning, but for the presentation, it could take a little bit too long. Uh, so that's why uh, I didn't show you this, but also you can do it without with only just one button uh, just to get the, uh, the the STL model or OBG with the texture. Yeah, the software is really easy and I can tell I'm not an engineer, I'm an archaeologist. Uh, I barely can turn on my phone and I can make this, this scan as well. So you just take the artifact, put it uh, in front of the scanner and click to start the scanning process and the software will do everything. Then you just click again to to make a model, and and that's all. It's just like like Peter said, few minutes, like 15, 20 minutes, and you're free to go. Do you have any question? Maybe we will go to uh, to sh to see. Maybe someone will write something. So, can we just can we ask questions, Natalia? Is that yeah, sure. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much. This is really good. Uh, and please share the recording as well. I think at the beginning, some some of the colleagues just didn't understand the link, and our teams doesn't always support external links. Anyway, thank you, uh, Piotr. First of all, the technical question. So we have some objects that will be slightly larger than the uh, turntable. So uh, yes. even without turntable, can we get the all sides automatically stitched up together? Uh, so when we talk about the bigger object, uh, so uh, this is not the biggest, this is like the smallest uh, turntable. Uh, so we have the turntable with the diameter, uh, it's uh, half a meter, mm -hmm. uh, and also it's up to 300 kilograms. Uh, so I think uh, the, this will be enough uh, to, to automate the process. Uh, and if you want to scan without the turntable, uh, so there is an uh, algorithm which uh, try to align according to the, to the geometry of the object. It's also automatic and uh, maybe if the object is, uh, you can put some markers, maybe not on the object, but near the object, uh, also to automate the process of, uh, of a scanning. Okay, thank you. I think Ulrike has a question. I may ask after that. Ulrike, please. Okay. Um, it's just, if you have an object, I mean, with a pot, you don't need to scan the base, but if you say have an hand X, then obviously you need all parts of the object. How does your method handle that? Like the bottom, the bottom of, of an object? You mean the uh, model is from every every part in this in this uh, particular one you can see the bottom right this is your answer how this is your question how we can you scan can the, bottom, base? the bottom sits on the turntable yeah yeah so then uh, you need to turn uh, the object so the, the scanner uh, as the scanner, you can, uh, we can say that it's as a human, so it needs to see the, the part which you are scanning. So you need to uh, put it on the on the top or put it on the uh, on the back on the side to scan it. Oh. Will, will that actually to follow up? That's a very good question because I wanted to ask that too. So we have lots of flat objects. So uh, last week uh, we did a, a photogrammetric model of a, of a slipper, like a shoe uh, from an ancient period and very fragile and very flat. So matching the two sides on the photogrammetry uh, is, is not aligning them is not very easy, as you know. So 
Uh, in those examples, will your software, for example, stitch them together very easily? Will it work? Um... Uh, yes, you can, uh, because uh, it depends from the size of it, but you can uh, put the markers near the object, not on the object, and then according to this marker, the software will very easily uh, align the scan, so uh, there is no problem with such an object. Okay, in this case, in this particular uh, jar on the on the turntable, so as Ulrika asked the bottom of it, if you scan it, for example, will you still use the markers or will you just ask the software? Mm -hmm. No, uh, you can do it, uh, for example, manually by picking the three points or you can run the, uh, the algorithm will, which will recognize the geometry and it will try to align the scans according to the geometry of the object. Okay. Okay, I still worry about that aspect, but okay, thank you. <laughs> that, that makes sense. I think some colleagues were, if I may, some colleagues were writing to me during the presentation as well, because everyone wants to know that. How much? How much does this cost? <laughs> the scanner itself and the turntable. It depends on the scanner, actually, and uh, what do you need it for, but uh, and the size of an object that you, you want to scan. So uh, I think the best uh, resolution in this case will be to write me uh, a note, like an email on contact me on LinkedIn on, or something, or even here, uh, just leave an information, like a basic information, what for you need it, uh, how big can be the objects, or you want it to scan, I don't know, the, the table or the chair, or more like like this small jewelry, and uh, I will just send you uh, directly uh, the offer. Okay, thanks so much. Thank you. Anyone else? Any more questions? Of course, if any question will be, uh, you you will find anything interesting during the day. You can always always contact with me. Okay, so I think for now there are no more questions. Uh, I will be waiting for for your emails and for your phones or the messages on LinkedIn uh, in case of any anything. Uh, for now, thank you very much again for joining. It was really nice to uh, to see you all and to be able to to give this lecture. Um, so thank you and uh, see you next time. I hope. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Thank bye. You. bye.